Well, let's take a look now at the role of black women in U.S. politics. For that, I'm joined by Deborah Douglas. She's a visiting professor of journalism at DePaul University and a senior leader with the Op-Ed Project. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Rochelle. So let's start by talking about the significance of Kamala Harris's historical vice president nomination, especially given the path to get to this point in the U.S. Well, I would argue that people might be more excited about Kamala than they are about um, about uh, Joe Biden. And I think it's because they're actually looking uh, beyond November and into the future. We may have very well met our first black woman president. And so then looking at the role and influence of former First Lady Michelle Obama now also in Joe Biden's presidential campaign and at the DNC, another obviously a huge figure in politics as well. What are your thoughts on her role? Well, she's a, a breath of fresh air because she's brought some maturity back into the conversation. People trust her. And when she opened up her comments the other night, and it, it, it instead again acknowledged again that she doesn't like politics, just like a lot of other people don't like politics. She did an important sort of level setting that uh, sets the stage for going back to get all of the other people who may feel disaffected or disengaged or who didn't vote the last time. So I view that as the beginning of uh, an ongoing conversation about implicating everybody into the, the voting process. And Michelle came out and she was Michelle. She was approachable and um, insane. <laughs> And so speaking then about engagement then, what are the key factors that are really energizing more black women to run for offices in record numbers? Well, the, the, the key factor is um, was summed up by Fannie Lou Hamer decades ago when she said that she was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I think that uh, black women feel that too. We're tired of doing all the work and not getting any of the benefits of having really great ideas about how to make this country better. And I think that in the last election, we realized, especially after 53% of uh, white women voters voted for Trump, is that if we were going to make a change and make a difference and make America better for us and the rest of the country, then we would have to roll up our sleeves and do it ourselves, which is what we usually do. So then historically, having more and more black women coming into this space, does that necessarily translate into more policies that reflect and address the needs and concerns of black women and women of color overall? I don't necessarily think that we can say something just translates automatically. Um, we, we've seen that these issues take a long time. Uh, basically, we're involved in a neo-civil rights movement. We had the mid-century civil rights movement. We had the 19th century civil rights movement. So, you know, a lot of things, uh, the, I guess the, the arc of time is, can be long, but there's no time better than now to get started on those issues. So will, th will change happen quickly? No. Will change happen? We can hope, given the situation that we're in. Now, something that we've seen recently, obviously, a lot of this back and forth over the proposed and now postponed changes to the U.S. Postal Service and its impact on mail-in voting just a few months before a major election. What are the most pressing issues when it comes to voting rights, as well as the remaining legal barriers for women of color as we mark 100 years after suffrage? Right. So it's time for everybody to bone up on their history, because even though we're celebrating the, the, the passage of this wonderful amendment that transformed our country, we know, or those of us who are grounded in this history, know that all women didn't get the right to vote when that amendment passed. And we have weathered the storm of efforts to repress the vote of historically stigmatized communities. Uh, black communities, uh, people of color, and black women in particular. And the idea that we can be in a situation where the current administration is so blatantly trying to suppress the vote by fussing with uh, an institution that we have long known and trusted, it's just really scary. The house is on fire and we got to put the fire out. <laughs> So then as you look at some of these other issues, not just in terms of uh, barriers when it comes to voting, but also faring in the fight against injustice and inequality in the U.S., how are women leaders faring on that front? Well, people are paying attention. If you look at the fact that um, I believe it was the New York Times did a front page story offering an analysis that suggests that the Black Lives Matter movement is the largest social justice movement in the history of the country. So in terms of how we're faring, people are hearing and people are listening. 
for a long time, well, since 2016, it seems like the dominant voices in this country were the voices who didn't want everybody to win and who didn't want fairness and equity. But I would have to say the way people have shown up um, in the wake of the George Floyd killing and Breonna Taylor and so many others, and even the roll call from the, uh, the Democratic National Convention uh, shows that there's another America out there. They just need to be seen, heard, and amplified. 